Okay, okay, hello everybody and uh, welcome to this uh, seminar. Today in that we have Kabir uh, and he will talk about uh, registered models and Bayesian approaches for solution events uh, heat conduction problems. So please, Kabir. Uh, okay, so first of all, I would like to thank uh, Fier for the introduction. So today I would like to talk about uh, using the reduce order modeling technique and integrate it with the uh, data assimilation technique in order to uh, predict a normal boundary condition uh, for an industrial uh, application, which is continuous casting in a casting setting. So uh, this is uh, the actually the a structure of my today's talk. First, I would like to talk about the goal and the methodology of the approach. Then I will describe the problem specification uh, focusing on computational fluid dynamics and the type of data assimilation that we are using in order to incorporate the data that we have uh, from the sensors and how this approach is capable of addressing the uncertainty and since this kind of data assimilation is computationally expensive, actually we are using a type of model order reduction, not only to reduce the dimensionality, but also to reduce the computational cost. And also we also analyze uh, the type of the many input parameters that we have and they really affect uh, the efficiency of the approach. So I also will continue with the uh, parameter surgery, how they really... Sorry, okay. because online they cannot see that you change slides. Um, okay, let's try this one. Okay, yes. Yes, I can uh, No, no, you can continue okay. where you sorry. Okay, sorry, Kabir. Thanks. So, okay, so, uh, okay, as I said, uh, in the result, in, in the result section, I would like to talk about. This, uh, the parameter of surgery and how they really affect the, the result of the, the, the data assimilation approach. And uh, in the following, I would like to talk about uh, the temperature pred prediction that we obtain through this uh, framework. And most importantly, the boundary condition that we are trying to estimate is, a, uh, is the heat flux, which can be seen as a normal new boundary condition for this industrial case study that we would like to estimate. Uh, and I also, also uh, will conclude with the summary and the future outlooks. Uh, at the end, I will uh, discuss about the question. And I mean, uh, if, if someone has any question, I would like to answer. So uh, this is the a structure of the continuous casting processes, uh, processing. For those who are not familiar with the process, uh, maybe it's better to briefly uh, talk about how this process is working and uh, what we need to estimate these heat flux. So uh, first of all, continuous casting is the widespread use of producing uh, ST in the industry. So as you can see, we have the molten ST that first goes inside the ladder. And then we have a piece of device, which they call a thumb dish. And in the third uh, phase, actually, the molten steel goes inside the mold. And the mold is responsible for refrigerating the molten steel. So for the company, it's really important to understand how many heat flux is extracted from the molten steel and goes inside the, inside the mold due to some concrete reason. The first one is that if we don't have a sufficient uh, heat flux extraction, it means that when the molten steel actually 
want to come out, it will be partially or mainly liquid. Uh, it means that after coming out, they are more likely to be formed. So it's really important the heat flux, the extraction of the heat flux be in a really sufficient way. But if the rate of the heat flux extraction is too much, it means that there is a possibility the, the molten steel will be solid when it is still inside the mold, which block the, the mold. So the operator has to uh, shut down the uh, process. Uh, so unfortunately, the company cannot actually put the sensor exactly inside the molten steel because due to the high level of uh, temperature that the molten steel has, it is more likely to be, uh, of course, it will be melted. So uh, what they basically do, actually, they put uh, the sensor inside the mold, as you can see on the right side. So this is the schematic of the mold. We have some uh, sensor, the sensor here is the Mocopos, which are responsible for providing the operators uh, for the temperature in some specific time. And this blue actually are representing the water, which are uh, responsible for uh, calculating the, I mean, for cooling down the, the mold. And also here we have an interface between the mold and the molten ST. If we solve this uh, equation, I mean, we, if we solve this case study, the heat flux here can be seen as a Newman boundary condition. But the thing that is really important, we need a method that can incorporate the data that uh, we have from the thermocouples in order to estimate the boundary condition. For this kind of things, we need to refer to the data assimilation technique. So here, the type of the data assimilation that we are using is an advanced extension of the ensemble Kalman filter. Uh, they call it uh, ensemble simultaneously input system filtering. So in the predict step of the ensemble, we have to solve the governing equation. So we use the computational fluid dynamics to, to do uh, this job. And also since any ensemble related filter is computationally expensive, we have to use uh, a, uh, a model order reduction technique just to reduce the computational cost. And here, uh, the model reduction that we are using uh, is a radial basis function. We have uh, two different uh, kernels for the RBF uh, kernel. The one, one is Gaussian, and the other one is multi-quadratic. We will see that the uh, multi-quadratic is more accurate than the Gaussian one when we want to estimate the heat flux. And okay, so so this is the three dimension of the prototype that we want to simulate. It is a continuous. Uh, Cooper mold. So we suppose that we know all the boundary condition with the exception of the boundary that is in contact with the molten steel. So the surrounding boundary condition is considered to be uh, adiabatic and the boundary which is in contact with the uh, actually we have an exterior boundary condition which is in, con which is in the contact with, with, uh, between the mold and also the water. Uh, the only boundary condition that we don't know is this boundary condition, which is interior boundary condition, and we are trying to estimate the heat flux. The unknown heat flux here is represented with the G, which is a function of time and space. And we can see this boundary condition as a unknown, as a Newman boundary condition. So as you can see here, we have some red points on the, uh, interior, on the interior boundary condition. Those red points actually are responsible for the center of the RBF kernel that we are using. It means that I use five RBF kernel in order to uh, parameterize the unknown boundary condition. Those uh, black points actually are responsible for the, the thermocouples that we are placed inside the mold. So I have 100 thermocouples that are in charge of providing me with the temperature at some specific point and five RBF. So the purpose here is that to uh, estimate the boundary condition with, the, with this uh, configuration that I have. So for this, it's better to dive into uh, the math. OK, well, before that, maybe it's better to give you an idea of how the data assimilation is working. OK, so data assimilation, suppose that at the beginning, I have a Gaussian distribution 
for the temperature and for the heat flux, I actually take this uh, initial distribution and uh, use the predict model in order to uh, obtain a prior uh, Gaussian distribution. I'm doing this one when I have uh, actually some observation available. So when I have some observation, I mean the data that are, com that are coming from the thermocouples, I'm using the data assimilation just to uh, enhance the prior distribution that I had here. So I use this one to update this prior distribution in order to have the posterior distribution. This posterior distribution is the one that I am looking for and it is much more closer to the true heat flux that we want to estimate. And this posterior distribution will be used as a prior distribution for the following time step. So this loop is continued until the last available observation data. But maybe this one gives you a better idea. This uh, actually shows the, how the state is changing over the time. The y-axis shows the state of the system, which can be temperature or uh, heat flux. And the x-axis actually shows time. The green line is something that I want to estimate. For my case study is the heat flux. And the brown line is something that is obtained through the predict model, but is not as much as accurate to, to the green one. But when I have the observation available, the, blue, the brown uh, line is getting much closer to the truth one and changing to the uh, purple line. I don't know this color, what this color is. So each time that I have the observation, this brown actually line, which is coming from the predicted model is getting closer to the truth one. This is the way that actually data assimilation is working and getting an initial guess and trying to get close this initial guess to the true one. So here maybe it's better to talk a little bit, I mean, to dive into the math behind the data assimilation that we are working. Uh, here the chi actually shows the temperature or the state of the data assimilation you are working. And this uh, lambda represents the governing equation. Here I'm solving the diffusion equation. And this U is exactly the boundary condition that I'm trying to reconstruct it. So I don't know what is the, what is the value of this uh, parameter. And this W and V are some are actually uncorrelated. Zero mean uh, a Gaussian process noise and measurement noise. So with the coordinates of the Q and R, this data actually represent the operator of the measurement. And uh, okay, so here uh, I suppose that the boundary condition that I want to reconstruct, uh, I'm using the RBF to parameterize this one, which is the multiplication of two, uh, two functions. So uh, RBF weight, which is a function of uh, time, and RBF Kelvin, which is, which is a function of the space. So the purpose here is to obtain this RBF weight through the time. And this N actually represents the number of RBF kernel that we are using. For my case study, I'm using five uh, uh, kernel. And the two type of the kernel that I mentioned before uh, I'm using for this approach is the Gaussian kernel and multi quality kernel. Each kernel has two uh, parameters. Uh, one is the uh, geometric parameter, and here we can see it as a theta. Some people call it the shape parameter. And the other one, which is the Euclidean distance between the center of the kernel to the center of each face on the boundary condition that we are trying to predict the uh, heat flux. So, and this is the true heat flux that I want to estimate. So the purpose here to, to use the data assimilation to estimate the heat flux, I mean, to estimate this one close to this one. As you can see, this one is a pretty complex, but we can see that the approach is capable of estimating uh, this pretty complex heat flux. And, uh, okay, so. So, uh, any Kalman filter related uh, uh, filter has three main steps, initial steps, predict a step and observation a step. In the initial step, we suppose that actually we have a Gaussian distribution of the estate and the parameter that we have. The estate here for my case study is temperature and the parameter 
uh, for this simulation is the uh, the RBF way, which we, we will use it to reconstruct the heat flux. So each state and parameter has a Gaussian distribution. It means that we need mean and the quarians in order to uh, actually uh, create this Gaussian distribution. We use this initial distribution and going to the second step, which is called forecasting step or update step. In the forecasting step, actually, I take this initial distribution and pass this initial distribution inside the Gauguin equation and then add the result with the process noise in order to have the new distribution for the state. So they call it this one the prior distribution. It means that the distribution that I have here will be changed and updated uh, with this one. So, uh, so this is okay. So this is the, uh, the posterior distribution that I have. This is the mean of that posterior distribution that I obtained in the equation three. And the purpose here is to update not only the state but also the parameter. So I introduce another value there variable that they call the joint ensemble. The joint ensemble consists of uh, RBF weight ensemble and also uh, state ensemble. I'm using this update step in each time step until I, I am sure that there is a, an available observation. When I have uh, observation available, uh, what basically I'm doing, uh, I call the measurement operator in order to uh, actually extract the observation ensemble and then uh, add this observation ensemble with the process noise. So the equation six actually uh, provide us with the observation ensemble. And then in equation uh, seven, actually we uh, obtain the mean of the joint ensemble and also the mean of this observation ensemble. So in the observation step, Actually, we need to uh, calculate the Kalman gain. For the Kalman gain, we need to uh, determine two different quarians. One is the quarians of the observation ensemble, which will be determined through the equation line. And the other one is the cross quarians between the observation ensemble and the joint ensemble. So by having the equation nine and equation 10, I can obtain the Kalman gain, which is a multiplication of the equation nine by the inverse of the equation 10. And then by having this Kalman gain, I can update the joint ensemble that I had in the beginning. So, so the new joint ensemble will be obtained by summing the prior uh, joint ensemble plus the multiplication of the Kalman gain with the difference between what is the provided by the term couples and what is uh, actually calculated through the uh, data assimilation framework, I mean, through this uh, observation ensemble. And then we can obtain, uh, so after obtaining the joint ensemble, it means that I can extract the parameter and also the estate ensemble from the joint ensemble. So in this stage, I have a new distribution of the uh, parameter and estate that I had at the beginning. So just to summarize what I did here, I mean, forget about the mathematics. So what I did, I have initial distribution for estate and parameter. I get this initial distribution and put it inside the governing equation, which gives me a new distribution. When I have observation, actually this new distribution will be updated, which will be more closer to the true one. So this is the way that actually data assimilation is working and this is the mask behind this uh, framework. So, so since I am solving uh, parametric problems, I have some parameters that I need to find the, the optimal value for each one. For example, I really need to know what is the best value for the quarians of the process noise, the quarians of the measurement noise, uh, I don't know, the quarians of the initial state and even the RBF weight. And since I'm solving an ensemble Kalman filter, even the number of seeds that I am using is of paramount importance, uh, even, for example, even the, the observation span, for example, for how many time steps I need data uh, will be collected from the thermocouples. So this is the optimal value for each one. And uh, so 
Uh, this is actually just to give you an idea of how each kernel look like. This is actually the Gaussian uh, kernel. Uh, I am plotting the Gaussian kernel for different value of the shape parameter. As you can see, when I have an S1 shape parameter, uh, my kernel is somehow flat, but when we increasing the value of the shape parameter, we will came across uh, a kernel which is more, uh, much more deeper and steeper. So uh, this is when I have the Gaussian RBF, but when I have the multi-quadratic one, uh, the, the kernel is look like that. Uh, I mean, it, it has the same uh, state when we increasing the number of, uh, when we increasing the value of the shape parameter, we will uh, came across uh, a kernel which is more uh, deeper. This kernel actually, uh, okay, as I said, I have five RBF. So each RBF uh, has a shape. The one that I'm plotting is the one that is exactly located in the heart of the boundary condition that I'm trying to predict. Because I have five RBF, four are located on the corner of the boundary condition and one located in the middle. The one that you are see here is for the, the middle RBF. The thing that is really important is that this kernel should be uh, distributed through the boundary condition that you are trying to estimate the, uh, the heat flux. So this is the uh, parameter uh, analysis that we did. Actually, uh, the y-axis represent the uh, spatial and temporal error for the heat flux, and the x-axis shows the sensitivity of this uh, error with respect to the uh, input parameter that I had. For example, the first figure shows uh, the optimal value for the shape parameter when I'm using the Gaussian RBF, it's something around 0 0.5. And the, the number of seats, uh, the optimal value for the number of seats when I'm using the Gaussian is something around 375. Uh, we did the same for the other input parameter, for example, the observation window. It tells that uh, uh, if we want to have a really a small error, we need we, uh, we need the, the data be collected if every four time a step when I'm using the Gaussian distribution. So uh, we apply the same procedure when I am using the multi-quadratic one. We realize that the shape parameter when I'm using the multi-quadratic is much more bigger than the one that I obtained when I'm using the Gaussian, which is approximately 3.5, and the number of seats uh, when I am using the multi-quadratics is around 300, which is less than the one that I obtained from the Gaussian. I mean, 75 uh, times uh, less than uh, Gaussian. It means that because when I'm using an ascender Kalman filter, I'm solving the Gaussian equation at each time a step as equal as to the number of seats that I have. So when I am using the multi-quadratic, uh, I'm solving the Gaussian equation 75 times less than Gaussian. So it means that uh, not only the multi-quadratic is much more accurate than the Gaussian, even the computational cost of the multi-quadratic is much less than uh, Gaussian one. And also regarding the uh, observation spanner window, we realized that I need at least two times the step the data will be collected through the uh, thermocouples. And the other input parameters, one in how much actually I need to shift the prior rate, I mean, the mean of the prior rate. The delta T, how actually the delta T affects the result of uh, this approach when I'm solving the Gaussian equation in the forward problem of the uh, ensemble Kalman filter. So, okay, so, uh, what I am plotting here, it is the temperature variation at a specific point inside the computational domain. So this blue line shows the, uh, the true temperature that I have because at the beginning, I suppose that I know the boundary condition. So I solve a direct uh, heat conduction problem, which provides me with the true value of the heat flow, uh, the, the temperature at each point that I want. So uh, this one represents the blue line, represents the true temperature at that prop. But the brown one 
uh, indicates the reconstructed temperature that we are obtaining through the data assimilation technique. And the shaded, uh, uh, the gray shaded area shows the confidence interval, which is between five and 95% of the, uh, the method. So as you can see, when I have the observation, uh, the error is tiny, but in between two observations, the error is increasing. Uh, something that is really important to tell that what I am learning through the data assimilation is a Gaussian distribution, but what I am plotting is the mean of this Gaussian distribution. There are two different things. So and this is when I'm using the Gaussian kernel, but when I am using the multi-quadratic kernel, the result is much more accurate. Is the same when I have the observation, uh, the reconstructed uh, temperature is much more closer to the true one. Uh, but in between two observations, the error is increasing because uh, I am adding the uncertainty to the uh, to the Galvin equation at each time I step. So, but the quantity of the interest that we are really interested in and we want to estimate is the heat flux. So we actually we choose a prop exactly on the boundary that we want to estimate. Uh, so again, like the previous one. Uh, the blue line is the is the true heat flux that we saw the equation in some previous slide, which is a function of time and space, and it is pretty complex. So the brown one is something that is obtained through the data assimilation when it is integrated with the Gaussian uh, RBF. Uh, we have the same when we uh, are using the multi-quadratic multi -quadrat kernel. As you can see, even visually, multi quadrating is much more accurate and closer to the uh, true heat flux. Uh, so, uh, and not only is much more accurate, but also computationally less uh, expensive uh, compared to that of the Gaussian one. And uh, so, okay, so this is uh, how the solution is changing. Uh, over a space at some specific uh, time step for the 5, 10, 15, and uh, 20 seconds. The column also shows the result when we are using the Gaussian. The column B shows the, the solution when we are using the multi quadratic one. And the column C shows the true one. Uh, even visually, it's obvious that the column B is much more closer than to column C. I mean, the, uh, the multi quadratic one is more capable of estimating the true heat flux uh, rather than the Gaussian one. So this is uh, actually how the solution is changing over time and space. This one is the true heat flux that we, as I said, we had, we saw the equation at the beginning. Uh, the other one, actually the, the animation, we shows the, uh, the predicted heat flux through the Gaussian RBF. There are some discrepancy, um, uh, but what I am plotting here is the mean of the Gaussian distribution. So when we are going to the following slide, we can see that uh, the multi-quadratic one uh, is much pretty similar to the, uh, to the true heat flux. So uh, if I want to sum up about these two animation, actually, as I said, the two, I mean, the using the multi quadratic one is more capable of estimating the heat flux better than the Gaussian one. So, just uh, to summarize what uh, I did, we integrate reduced order modeling with a data assimilation technique to, uh, in order to estimate a non moon boundary condition for an industrial case study, which is a continuous casting process. So, but in a stochastic setting, uh, we realized that when we are using the Gaussian RBF, the result is a little bit far away from the true one. So it's better to use the multi quadratic one. Uh, not only we were able to estimate the heat flux, also we were able to estimate the state, I mean the temperature in a stochastic setting as well. About the future work, actually what I, uh, we did uh, was uh, introducing the dimensionality of the parameter. So for the future work, we can use uh, uh, intrusive reduced order modeling instead of solving the, uh, the diffusion equation, we can use the reduced order modeling. 
And also we can use some scientific machine learning like physics inform neural network uh, to reduce the computational cost. And uh, for this work, we only use two different RBF. In the future, we can uh, investigate more uh, RBF kernel, like for example, inverse multi-quadratic one. And the location of the RBF, even the number of the RBF that we are using uh, really affects the result of the framework. So this number of RBF or the type of RBF is something that we can investigate in the future as well. Uh, however, we can also uh, estimate different types of the complexity of the heat flux to have a really general solution for uh, predicting the heat flux in the continuous casting process. Okay, so I'm finished here and thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much. Nice and uh, now it's question time. So, if you okay, just curious, can you provide us some uh, details about the implementation of the framework uh, with the solar? Everything actually is implemented. Uh, I mean, we, we are using the open core for solving the uh, heat flux and also. The, all of this data assimilation framework actually is implemented to C++ to be coupled with the open form as well. Okay, but you have implemented everything from scratch in C++? Yes. Oh, cool. cool. And uh, recently I'm doing the same approach in the Python to couple with the commercial CFD solver mm -hmm. in order to estimate the unbounded condition in abdominal aorta. To because uh, in the abdominal aorta it's really important to understand the profile velocity to uh, to obtain the blood shear stress. So uh, the, the code will be I mean much better than C plus plus when you are using the part. But I mean C plus plus. It is open or the, the uh, uh, is no? Actually, I'm I'm done with two D dimension and I'm working on three dimension. Okay. No, not yet. Not yet. It is free uh, or yeah, if I finish my work, I will actually upload it. You can push your own data. Yeah, I will do that. <laughs> okay, okay. I have another question. If you uh, can go at the slide uh, 15, if I do not 15, uh, 12, uh, the slide with the arrow. Yeah. This one? Okay, the errors. Uh, what, are, what are the errors? How they are? The, the error actually is the relative error between the reconstructed heat flux. And the true heat flux normalized by the true heat flux. And after that, actually, I mean in a space and time to, to have a, just one value. Okay, in space and time. Yes, exactly. The time because the flux is changing over time and space. After obtaining the, the relative error, just I get the mean in a space and time to have one value. Because I, I need one value to, for each input parameter, I need one value to, to come. Yes, yes, yes. To, uh, to uh, compromise which one is more accurate. Okay, okay. Other questions from the room or online? So, I have a question. Uh, the temperature results that you were showing, uh, so it's like uh, the TS that there was. Right? Okay. So, uh, independently of the uh, kernel that you use, the uh, uncertainties that you've got to me seems completely awful in the sense that you cannot get uh, when you're outside the in the, when you're outside the acquisition, you cannot get uh, let's say a reasonable uncertainty against the true problem, right? The, the true temperature problem. So yeah, I, I didn't catch your question. Sorry. So can you see the uncertainty from the zoom? Yeah, the, the, the uncertainty is this one, the green. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. and they, they cannot actually get to the true uh, so no, the uncertainty it. should be should be a small when you have the observation, but when you don't have the observation, the uncertainty should be increased. So, yes, I agree. so here, for example, here that I have the observation, there is no uncertainty, which is really a small. You need to zoom in, but when you move from here to here, uncertainty is increasing. Yes. In between two observations, uh, can you see like a little bit on the right? Uh, the okay. Uncertainty is uh, even in the observation. Maybe it's a lot. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that the uncertainty is increasing a bit. I mean, this is the nature of the data assimilation because we don't have the observation every time it's that you are adding the process in order to your governing equation. So it, it should be increasing. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Which uh, I think Dario uh, means your uncertainty bound cannot cover the true value. Uh, sorry, I didn't catch you. Like the uh, uncertainty bound cannot cover the true value. Uh, because from the picture. I agree that no, the, the I mean the mean I mean the mean of the reconstructed temperature should be uh, in the middle of the uncertainty, yes. not should be the true one. What I am plotting is the mean of this Gaussian. Yeah. So this mean should be exactly in the middle of the uncertainty that I'm plotting. That depends on how you construct the the uncertainty should cover the missing condition. Yeah. Yeah. The values that you don't observe. At least you should cover that because you don't observe. So, in, in reality, you don't have those values in between. And uh, and you would like a model to get uncertainty in the, in the value that you're missing. So, you mean that uncertainty also should cover the two bit lot as well? Yeah, that's what I think. So, but in two bit, no, 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 you, you, you are right. You are right. But uh, you should consider the quadrants that I'm given at the beginning. If you get the quadrants of the process node is a little bit much low, uh, bigger. Of course, it actually uh, covered the two one as well. The quadrant is the, the quadrant of the process noise and the measurement noise is the hyperparameter. We need to tune that. If I do the same simulation and increase the quadrant of the process noise, it will be exactly the same that you are doing. Okay, so the question is online or Okay, if not, uh, we can thank the uh, again for the talk. Thank you. Thank you. And see you to the next uh, JS. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, guys.